Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I know everybody is very tired, so uh, I will try to be very fast on this. Um, my purpose is to explain what is the sense and the purposes of the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate, which I have the honor to chair. So basically, um, briefly, the whole idea is we have worked by two years fighting against this quite extended prejudice in the sense that uh, tackling climate change implies huge economic cost. And that is the way, in we, or that is the argument why governments and businessmen, in particular governments, are not taking action against climate change. So it's the traditional trade-off between short-term decisions and long-term decisions. And at the same time, it's the whole idea that if you need to sacrifice economic growth or poverty alleviation efforts or job creations, you won't take any kind of actions against climate change. So fighting against this dilemma, we have worked by two years in a row and we produced two quite interesting reports which I recommend very much. You can find them in, in www.newclimateeconomy.report. Um, basically, our conclusion is, it looks like obvious, it is not obvious, but it's true, that it is possible to have better growth and a better climate at the same time. But the point is that we analyze, um, we consider that the last window of opportunity we have in order to do both is the next 15 years in which we need to take actions and basically we need to work and change three basic systems. And I will go quickly in, uh, uh, in, in this part. First, we analyze, for instance, the performance of the countries and regions that already have taken action against climate change. And currently, it results that there is not clear evidence that taking action on climate change, being responsible with the environment, causes such economic sacrifice. Actually, if you take most of the reasons, for instance, Sweden. Sweden, in, in these almost uh, 25 years that has taken actions against carbon emissions, Sweden has decarbonized its economy, reducing its emission 23%. And currently, at the same time, Sweden has grown almost 60%. So where is that correlation between the higher the emissions are, the higher the economic growth. This is the case in which you can see the other way around. You can use the Regional Global Greenhouse Initiative in the United States itself. In the United States, several, several states have put in place quite important, and in some cases, like in California, aggressive measures. And the outcome is, again, the same. They have grown, and at the same time, they have reduced carbon emissions. You can see the case of California growing 24% in this century and reducing emissions by 20%. So Denmark growing 40%, reducing 25%. Ontario and Canada growing 50% and reducing emissions by 6 British Columbia, Europe Union, even, even considering the global the recession Europe has suffered in recent years, has grown 45% and has reduced emission almost 20%. And finally, the evidence related with last year at global level. 2014 was the first year in which the global economy grew, despite the fact that there is not enough economic growth, but global economy grew and by first time ever didn't increase carbon emissions. So the first time in 40 years, Last year, GDP globally grew 3%, while emissions didn't grow. So that is the evidence, and we analyze all those factors. And we conclude, briefly, that what do we need to do in order to tackle this problem, in order to address the climate risk, and at the same time get an economic growth? The conclusion of the commission is, well, it's a, it's a two bold reports. But basically, we conclude that we need to change three big systems. Those systems are, first, cities. 
Um, the basic conclusion is like this. The current sprawling model of cities is not viable anymore. So in the last century, we have created cities more based in the use of individual cars, more based in expanded territorial cities, and that it's impossible to continue that model. Actually, more compact, connected, and coordinated cities with higher density and cities more concentrated in a massive transportation system are not only less polluting, but also much more productive and providing better quality of life for the people. And basically, is one fundamental truth is we estimate that in the next 15 years, we are going to receive in the cities more than 1 billion people at global level. So 1,000 million people are going to come to live in the cities in urban populations, it's additional one, which implies to build, for instance, one city the size of Paris Central every 15 days during the next 15 years. One Paris every 15 days during the next 15 years. That's the size of the challenge regarding the cities. If we try to continue the model of sprawling cities, it's not going to be possible to receive such amount of, more, um, of people, but also it's going to deteriorate even more in carbon pollution. I want to emphasize this because if you analyze most of the research are more related with energy, which is true, more related with energy efficiency, which is fantastic, more related with renewable energy, which is huge, is fantastic as well. But the point is we need to analyze different systems to change and different public policies that we need to put in place in order to address this issue. The second system we need to change is the land use. And basically, as you know, all the issues regarding land uses, for, land use, for instance, agricultural or forestry or deforestations, counts by 25% of global emissions. Actually, only deforestation implies by more than 12% of total carbon emissions. So we need to change land use, the system, in order, for instance, to produce more food in order to feed more people and in a better way. But under the restriction that we need to do that in the same or even less surface for agricultural purposes. And in this particular role, technology plays an incredible role in order to address that issue. And the third system we need to change, I already mentioned that, is of course energy. We need to decarbonize the economic growth and that is possible through basically two ways. Two ways. One is energy efficiency. We estimate at least roughly 50% of the efforts we need to make is more related with energy efficiency. Curiously, energy efficiency is probably the best example of the message that the Commission wants to get across, which is you can do well by doing good. You can do, as a company, for instance, a lot of money with saving energy mechanism, but at the same time, you can reduce your emissions. Actually, it's completely correlated. You use less energy producing the same or even much more, you will reduce, you will make a lot of savings, and you can increase your own revenues and profits. So where is the secret, not secret, where is the main stream of discovery that the Commission needs to talk today? It is not only this part that works in order to reduce carbon emission, but also we realize that doing so, it is possible to get a new kind of economic growth. And let me start to say in this, there is not business as usual model. Why? Because honestly, my friends, the current economic path, even carbon-intensive path is not working. 
it's not working anymore. You can see that here in Europe, but you can see that, for instance, in Japan, the quantitative easing, the avionomics, is not working anymore. China, this fantastic giant of economic growth, is getting worse outcome right now. Nobody knows exactly how reliable are the Chinese data, but the point is, during 24 months in a row, the index, the price index for producer is negative. According to the, with the official data, the job creation in China will be almost zero this year. Something has happened there. And you see my friends and neighbors in South America. We have an incredible recession in the largest economy in the region, which is Brazil. So we can see that the current model is not working anymore, or at least is not delivering the kind of economic growth we need. No, what are the options? We believe that if we switch to our low carbon economy, we can get not only better outcome related with the climate, but also much better, or at least an important outcome related with economic growth. Why is that? We say that if we put in place the right measures, we can trigger at least three, import, three or four important drivers, new drivers of economic growth. These drivers are resource productivity, establishing the right price to natural resources, including carbon, or even water, for instance, for agricultural purposes and others. You can increase the productivity of the whole economy. Listen, all the uh, businessmen and governments, we always are talking about how to increase the labor productivity or how to increase the capital productivity. But our point is this, yes, that is correct, but now <clears throat> we have a secret weapon in the productivity of natural resources. And with these kind of measures, we can increase that. Second driver of the new climate economy is the investment of infrastructure for new economy. So we are estimating, my friends, that uh, we will need, even following the current path of the high-intensive, carbon-intensive economy, we will need in the next 15 years roughly like $90 trillion in infrastructure either for cities, energy, or land use. Now, if we switch all the way to a low-carbon economy, we will need roughly like 94 so the, the difference is really marginal. And actually, if you consider at net present value, we need to do those maths, but it is possible that at the end of those 15 years, we can get even lower costs, in particular associated with lower operational costs, for instance, in renewable energy. So, but even without it, having a difference of less than four trillion out of 90, it's not exactly a crucial difference if we are going to invest such amount of money. It's a very frequent question saying, well, it sounds good to have this low carbon economy, but where are we going to get that money? And the answer is, we can get that money exactly from the same sources from we were going to get it in the inertial path. Or in other words, if we are going to invest one way or another $90 trillion in the next 15 years, let's do it the right way now. So, if we are going to invest in a power plant for the facility, for instance, why do we need to invest in a coal power plant that will lock in in the next 50 years if we can do that in a renewable facility? Maybe the initial cost will be a little bit higher, but the operational cost will be much less, with plenty of certainty, <coughs> and in that way, we can invest in the low carbon economy since now, and the source of such kind of investment is exactly the same. So it's a false dilemma saying we have no money to new carbon, low carbon economy, but, but we have for the old one. No, it's the same. It's question of to do the smart and right decision starting today. And the third driver is related with innovation. And that's the matter of this uh, quite important summit or, or meeting. 
You know very well, and I'm very sure that all my uh, former speakers have talked about it, innovation is the main engine, engine of economic growth since the wheel was invented. So history, economic history is about innovation. Now, innovation could come just from the original ideas of the mind, just like a, somebody like Isaac Newton seated under a tree, seeing an apple going down, or innovation could come not only for imagination, but also for economic incentives to do that. And yes, we need a new regulatory framework to trigger innovation. And that's our point. If we put the right measures in place, we can trigger innovation that will foster the economic growth. It could provide the economic growth exactly as we are looking for right now. So that's the whole idea of better growth and better climate, which is the core of our report. So going quickly towards our recommendation, of course, basically, we are suggesting the governments to integrate climate risk in strategic decisions because one of the problems we can see is for a lot of governments, environmental issues is a question like a separated thing. No? You have a, a department of treasury, you have a ministry of uh, energy, and you have a ministry of foreign affairs, and oh yes, you have a minister of environmental issues. No, it's not that way. You need to integrate these issues, in particular, in across-the-board strategy. And that is a crucial issue right now. Of course, we are pushing since one year ago in order to take solid, bold international agreement, and that's the thing we are waiting here in Paris. We are pushing a lot in order to face now fossil fuels. It's incredible that currently we are spending, as human beings, $500 billion dollars in fossil fuel subsidies, which is incredible because we are paying from the taxpayers to pollute the atmosphere. And it's, it's incredible that we are looking for 100 billion to support the transition, coming probably from the governments. But governments, especially in developing countries, are paying 500 billion already in absurd fossil fuel subsidies. Carbon pricing, it's happening already. More than 40 countries are establishing carbon price, and that's exactly the right economic incentives that we need. Why? Because carbon price is the signal that most of the investors need in order to trigger their switch towards low carbon economy. Innovation, I made my comments on that. Reduce capital costs for green infrastructure, for instance, Solar energy in India is completely viable. However, only the interest rate implies to increase 25% the cost of solar energy there. So we need to, to allocate resources, for instance, for developing banks in order to reduce the financing process for renewable energy and other green infrastructure. Cities, we need to transit to compact and well-connected cities, stop building elevated highways, elevated highways in the cities, you start to invest heavily in massive transportation system everywhere, in particular BRTs. Forests, it's crucial to stop deforestation and we need to put in place economic incentives in order to provide economic income for all those indigenous communities living in forestry everywhere. Restore degraded lands, the same issue. And again, the two ideas coming together increase or protect or restore the degraded land and you will get more economic income for the people living from those lands, so those, those soils. Drive low carbon growth through business and investor action. And Paris has an incredible difference from other cops. And believe me, I have been in a lot of them, even in Copenhagen. What is the difference in Paris? Private sector is the main actor in this game. Private sector is saying, I want to play. There are 1,000 companies supporting carbon price. There are uh, a lot of companies, the best oriented in climate issues, outperforming uh, the Bloomberg index by almost 10% in the last four years. 
There are the companies organized by uh, the, the richest businessmen recently saying, we want to support technology and innovation in that field. So private sector is coming and pushing really hard for sanity coming from public policies. Uh, other quite specific issue, aviation and maritime industry are able to save a lot of energy with small innovation and hydrofluorocarbons. We, we face down the use of hydrofluorocarbons. We can reduce that part. Now, just to end, uh, let me do some maths. This is business as usual process in which you can observe we need to reduce almost 70 gigatons. Uh, in the estimation we have made in the commission quickly, you can see in different gigatons how much we can save from the different measures we are recommending. At the end, we can get it. We can close the gap. We can keep the temperature under two Celsius degrees, doing the right things for the environment, but at the same time do, doing the right thing for the economy. And that is the great news we have in the report. We can have better economic growth and we have better climate at the same time. You have the courage to act right now from the government and from the business sector together in order to address the problems that the planet may have today. So that is the message, and thank you very much for inviting me today.